but I don't think that either one of them are going to be particularly happy about having to alter their, you know, their framework to to accommodate these things. Uh, you know, this reality I think is going to be unwelcome in both camps. Kathy in Washington, state of. Hi, Kathy. Uh, hi, uh, Lloyd and uh, George. Hello. Uh, my question is: Have they ever tried to um, hook up fiber optics to those two little drilled holes in the back of the crystal skulls? I don't know. You'd have to ask uh, Mr. Holman that the guy that now you know controls the um, the crystal, you know the the Mitchell Hedges skull. Anna Mitchell Hedges died, I think, last year, and she put Bill Holman, uh, you know, in charge of it, kind of in the way that I'm in charge of the um, of the Star Child skull. And um, and you know you'd, you'd have to ask him that. I, I really don't. I really don't know. Sorry. Are they Are they in contact with any um, spiritualist churches? Because I first heard about this crystal skulls in a spiritualist church in Seattle. Well, they uh, they deal a lot with metaphysics. Uh, you know, metaphysical people, people who are interested in metaphysics and spiritual things, tend to use crystals as a as a medium for that. Crystal skulls uh, being you know a particular kind of crystal that they use. So yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Again, I'm not much. I have to I have to admit this. I'm not much of a crystal skull person. I'm not that knowledgeable about it. I got. I got this experience with the Mitchell Hedges skull because, like like everybody, I think I'm interested in that one simply because it's so unusual in the world of crystal skulls. All the rest of them are are fairly normal, and it's clear that they've been carved and they even have histories and they they know when they were carved, where they were carved, whatever. But the Mitchell Hedges skull is a huge, giant mystery, and I think it's going to remain that way for quite some time. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, uh, also. Um I, um, I had a, a psychic tell me in that church that the uh, crystal skulls actually contain a real entity, a real hum, a real, um, you know, and being. Right. Again, that's better left for for Bill Holman to deal with. It's really not my field, and it's not my artifact. Ah, uh, but the uh, Star Child. That's another question. That's another question, right? But not not like not like the crystals. How skull. close? How closely does it resemble a, a gray? And you said originally your people thought it might have been. Yeah, it's really remarkable. If you if you go with the standard uh, outline, now now don't think about the gray on the cover of the book Communion, because while that is the archetypal figure of a gray, it is in fact not how grays look. Um, it, there, there was an article in a uh, MUFON journal uh, a couple of years ago by Bud Hopkins in which he explained very clearly that the cover of uh, communion is used as a litmus test by researchers frequently in dealing with abductees, and they'll show that cover and say, is this what you saw? And if they say, yeah, yeah, it looked a lot like that, then they know right away that this is a person who's not necessarily telling the truth because that is not the standard depiction of what they're given. It's really like the star child, which is, again, that heart-shaped face instead of that glowering kind of elongated face that you see on the communion cover. It looks like a heart uh, with, you know, uh, upper crown, upper crown, you know, a, a dent in the middle, in, in the rear of the head, and then coming down to a very thin, small, narrow, almost pointed lower face, and that is what the star child has. Okay, thank you. Steve, Chicago, Illinois, east of the Rockies. Steve, you're on with Lloyd. Yeah, how you guys doing? Good. Um, all right, my question's got to do with the star child skull. Okay. That, um, that he can answer. If I'm, yeah. if I'm correct, you guys said that when the girl found the skull, she found the skeleton too, right? No? She found the skull. What? She found the skeleton with the skull. Yeah, she found the, she found two full skeletons in a mine tunnel. The there was one skeleton exposed on the surface, lying on its back. There was another buried uh, a mound of dirt beside that one, and coming out of that mound of dirt was what she called a misshapen hand emerging from the dirt, and that hand was wrapped around the upper arm bone of the one laying on the on the surface of the the mine tunnel. So. Because 
because it was in a mine tunnel, there was no compaction of the soil by rain or anything, so she was able with her bare hands to scrape that dirt away to see where the hand was coming from, and it came, she exposed a whole skeleton smaller than the one on the surface, and that one was about five feet tall based on the size of the skull, so we assume that the star child skeleton, which is the one that was in the in the ground, in the grave, was about four feet tall, and so she attempted to recover both uh, both skeletons. I won't take the time about what happened, but it's it's all in the book. If if anybody wants to explore it to that degree, and she ended up with just the two skulls banged up a little bit, lost the jaws. Um, they it all got swept away in a flood. Long story, but uh, she did recover the two the two skulls that we have now that represent them, and a piece of maxilla, upper right maxilla, of the star child. Okay, good. Next up, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Darcy, first-time caller. Hey, Darcy. Hi, George and Lloyd. How are you today? Good, Darcy. Um, Just listening to Lloyd, it kind of reminds me of a a photo that's always kind of stuck in the back of my head from uh, early last century, which was the Deloys ape. Has um, Lloyd's research uh, gone into looking at that type of creature at all? Yeah, I have. The the, the Deloys ape is from my understanding of it, is just really a large monkey, a South American monkey, that um, someone fairly recently gave a type name to. It was distorted and bloated somewhat from death, which gave it a little bit of, you know, it had already begun the bloating process from death to give it some extra size relative to that kind of monkey. But they said if you reduced it down, that it would be that kind. Uh, But yes, that, that is a very famous photo, and I am aware of it. Okay, thank you. Lloyd, what other things are you investigating? Are you just concentrating right now on the documentary and the Star Child project? No, I'm I'm absolutely running on two tracks as I always do. I have I have one foot firmly planted in the UFO alien thing with the Star Child, but I have the other foot just as firmly planted in the world of, of hominoids and human origins with my work with everything you know is wrong. So in my spare time when I'm not involved with the Star Child, I work on revising everything you know is wrong. And I, I really I think I I'm probably the only researcher in the world that has, you know, has feet firmly planted in those two worlds. And I'll tell you just a, an interesting anecdote about sure. it. Um, people, in, when I speak to a, a, a hominoid crowd, they absolutely believe that because they've either seen it or they know somebody that has, but they believe it 100%, but they don't believe necessarily in UFOs and aliens. You go talk to a, a UFO alien crowd, and they firmly believe in it. They've seen one. They know somebody that has. They believe it. But they don't necessarily believe in hominoids. Why? Because they believe what science tells them about the other thing. They know science is wrong about when science – if you believe in Bigfoot and science says, you know, Bigfoot's wrong, well, they, they know. Science is wrong there. But science says that UFOs and aliens, well, they don't know. So they take their word for it. And it's the same way on the other side of the coin. I I'm always amazed that somebody with a perfectly open mind in one area, because they've seen and they know for a fact, will blindly accept what they're told about the other subject. It's amazing to me. Okay, let's go to San Diego, Derek, west of the Rockies. Go ahead, Derek. Hey, um, how you doing, George? Good, Derek. Um, how you doing, Lloyd? I'm fine. Um, is my question is kind of in like the first caller's sort of question when it comes to um, not really being religious or anything. I don't know how much you know about Genesis, but um, a lot of the things you're saying just really just intrigues me because, you know, in Genesis it talks about the six fingers, six toes, you know, the giants. You know, and you had mentioned that, you know, of course we've heard about finding giants. Um, and earlier you had mentioned about the Anayaki, Anayaki earlier you had mentioned that, said it right. real quickly. Right. Um, so I know, I, I see that you do, you know, have some, you know, more of what's, being, you know, going here. Also, I, I want, what I wanted to say, my question is, is how much of genetics um, that 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 can be changed or when you talk about the chromosomes can be changed, um, how much genetics? How much? How much genetics do you think um, can keep it keep it from us from having? Because um, we have spirits and stuff, and I wanted to know if we're being genetic. That's kind of like making me think about you know like what we're going on right now. You know, taking some DNA from somebody and you know and creating George again. 
So I don't know if we want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I think about genetics, that's what comes to my mind. Um, so I just wanted to know that you said that we were domesticated, you know, animals. 